So if you if you have for example 50, 50 layers of our solar cell absorber materials, they are still thinner than a human hair. Hello and welcome everybody to a new episode of Your Friendly Physicist and Other Nerds, your science podcast where scientists speak about their fantastic research, their visions, their dreams, challenges and their daily life in the fabulous world of science. My name is Lucas, I'm your friendly physicist and today we will talk with Lena Dreb, who is sitting in front of me on a screen. So this is the very first episode which is not in person in one room. This has a special reason because Leonard is sitting in Canada, a few thousand miles away uh, from Germany, from Munich, where I am sitting. And welcome, Leonard. Nice to, to have you. And today we are talking about Leonard's research, which is about special types of solar cells and how they are performing in space. So hi, Leonard. Yeah, hi. Hi, hi Lucas. Nice, nice seeing you and nice hearing you from, from this far distance away <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's super great uh, thank you very much for having you here in your podcast yeah thank you for participating it's uh, really great okay Leonard so very first question um, everyone has to answer on this podcast uh, since it's called your friendly physicist and other nerds um, would you consider yourself being a nerd uh, yes so um, I think being a scientist or uh, in particular being a physicist usually qualifies someone to be a nerd. So for me personally, for example, I have an IR cam built in in my phone. And uh, so I can measure temperature, I can control the heat plate in the lab, or I can see here when it's minus 25 degrees, if body circulation still works. Um, yeah, so I can also find the coldest beer in the fridge in a party, <laughs> which um, yeah, <laughs> makes it sound like a nerd. Um, yeah, but I think I think to break it down, um, if if you can keep your curiosity, fascination, or also enthusiasm um, when doing just particular things um, that might appear weird or boring from the outside, um, and if you can dive in the, in your own mind and in your own world and play there with your things like, like children did, um, then I think uh, you can say you're a nerd. Yeah, absolutely agree. That definitely qualifies uh, being a nerd. Uh, and I'm very happy. So we have a conversation of two nerds. Isn't that great? <laughs> uh, cool. So, yeah. So before we talk uh, about your science, uh, let me shortly introduce you. Um, so you studied uh, physics at uh, the LMU. So Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Bachelor and Master, with a focus on astrophysics. So I see uh, an early curiosity about space and, and our universe. And after the master studies, you joined the chair of functional materials. This is also where we met as a PhD student. And right now you are in Canada. So doing an internship with uh, collaboration partners in, in Canada, in Edmonton, right? Yeah in Alberta. Um, so this is uh, for three months and it's based on material characterization um, where we're employing uh, special advanced characterization methods on um, yeah, my thin films that I uh, made in Munich and brought with me. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, then we are already at your science case, uh, your research. What is your research about? So it's it's about solar cells, uh, but can you let's say shortly summarize it in, in a few sentences? Yeah, sure. Um, so my uh, main topic is based on perovskite solar cells. So perovskite is the material called I'm specializing in. And um, so my main project is testing these perovskite and also organic solar cells uh, in space during a suborbital rocket flight. So we developed an experiment and uh, pursued the first ever flight to space of the solar cell technologies that are emerging. Exactly. And um, apart from that, what I also want to mention, um, so usually you have not only one project, but multiple projects. <laughs> um, so a colleague and I, Manuel and I, we um, developed um, um, a scattering data analysis tool 
um, during COVID. So COVID helped <laughs> doing things on your computer, obviously. And uh, yeah, this is based on Python and uh, a fast tool that is customizable and uh, allows for yeah cool data analysis. And then there is also um, more the material side itself, where um, we are trying to print the perovskite layers and optimize this printing process, which is then also used for printed solar cells, obviously, uh, that could be um, upscaled for industrial processing in the future. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, that sounds so, in there were so many things uh, that sounds sounded so, so awesome, so interesting. So let's break it down maybe in the consumable science snacks. So different types of solar cells. You mentioned perovskite solar cells and you mentioned organic solar cells. So these are two different types then, I, I assume. Yes. Um, so basically, um, we in general call these new class of solar cells. Um, yeah, they are soft. They are um, perovskites are um, compounds of organic and inorganic elements, um, organic um, solar cells are uh, synthesized from elements like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, or oxygen. Um, so you can do it from um, oil or synthetic fuels if you want. Perovskites are uh, hybrid um, crystal networks of, of uh, organic and inorganic um, materials. And so what you add in there usually is lead or iodine. Um, so, uh, yeah, these elements are abundant as well. And so, in principle, the uh, precursor materials are all quite cheap and available. Okay, so that's basically the advantages over, let's say, uh, classic uh, silicon solar cells, which you can buy in, in, in a typical store, warehouse store. Yes, I mean, so first of all, for solar cell materials to, um, to be, <laughs> let's say, good materials, uh, of course, they need to be abundant. So this is, I think, uh, the first first step. In this terms, we don't have big advantages yet um, compared to silicon because silicon is a very very abundant, uh, yeah, element on Earth. So there we are not running into shortage shortages. However, silicon needs um, quite energy demanding um, processing. You need to heat it up. You need to purify it. You need to bring it into these mono or polycrystalline wafers. Um, so yeah, this is quite demanding. And um, this is not what we need to do with our soft materials. So we can um, yeah, basically create our thin films from solutions. We can uh, do this at room temperature or at low ambient temperatures and this brings also many advantages for the solar cells later. So it's much more energy saving or it's much less energy demanding to process or to go from the raw materials in these perovskite, in these organic solar cells to the functional solar cell in the end that you, that you can apply. Yeah, but, but this, is, this, is, this is actually only one of the, let's say, main advantages of, of these material classes. Um, a second advantage is um, the layers you um, produce, they are ultra thin. So what does ultra thin mean in, in, in length scales? So if you, if you have, for example, 50, 50 layers of our solar cell absorber materials, they are still thinner than a human hair. Thinner than a human hair. Or if you, or if you want to turn it around, uh, if you want to deposit um, such a layer on a, um, a soccer field, then you need two liters of ink for this entire soccer field. And so this is amazing uh, degree of, of yeah, um, resource uh, um, yeah, use in terms of, yeah, you just need very small amounts and you can do a lot of that. And how about, how about performance? I mean, how are these uh, types of solar cells performing compared to silicon solar cells? Yeah, so this is actually very fascinating what has been happening in the last few years in the time since i started uh, doing research on perovskites uh, the the efficiency i mean so in terms of efficiency what, what does efficiency mean maybe we need to clarify this shortly um, 
for solar cells, what we want to have is a high efficiency. And efficiency means we compare the incident solar power with the output power our solar cell can generate. And so this ratio gives you a percentage. And this is the power conversion efficiency that usually is a measure for yeah, the quality of a solar cell apart from stability that is also very important. And yeah, so silicon solar cells that you can uh, buy, they are right now maybe at around 20% efficiency. And uh, the best silicon cells you produce in the lab, and this is our, actually the ones we need to use to compare because our research solar cells of perovskite and organic ones we also make in the lab, so this is the benchmark. Um, so there the silicons are at 25 up to 26 percent but yeah also the perovskite ones are already above 25 percent in these research cells and also organic solar cells um, are already more than have, have reached more than 17 percent uh, so there are new material developments um, that yeah just five years ago haven't been possible uh, or not uh, yeah they it was not envisioned to have this extreme fast degree of of progress yeah. so you think you think this progress i mean it's it's awesome but do you think this progress will continue like like that or is it is it is it is the curve flattened down a bit yeah i mean this is this is this is something that that science had have uh, has told us in the last centuries um it's it's always uh difficult to to say, okay, now we're leveling off and uh, the limits are reached and then suddenly there is a new breakthrough and everything you said is just um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not Pulverized. important anymore. Um, but yeah, so I think just physically speaking, the limits of at least perovskite solar cells of, um, of, of what, what, is, what is possible in terms of maximum efficiency is yeah we are close to that so maybe we can gain a few percent more of efficiency but then we are approaching the physical limit that is at around 30 percent um, for let's say classical perovskite solar cells but what people are starting to do more more and more is to work on tandem systems so tandem systems means you have multiple solar cell absorbers on top of each other that are spectrally different or that have basically a different color and so you have for example two solar cells on top of each other where the top solar cell is letting letting through or let, lets through uh, most of the light that is for example red light and just absorbs the blue light and the lower solar cell is collecting the red light in an efficient more efficient way than a single solar cell could do and by this, you can increase the theoretically achievable um, efficiency. And so these tandem cells are coming in terms of uh, perovskite silicon tandem cells. So uh, this is also something where I guess commercialization will be quite soon. Or also perovskite organic or organic organic perovskite perovskite. So you can combine whatever you want. So you're harvesting more or less the whole solar radiation spectrum, not just uh, the visible range, but also yeah, the near infrared or the UV part of, of the so solar exactly. light spectrum. Yeah, you, by just combining diff you different harvest, types of solar cells. That's quite smart. That's quite smart. So in total, you harvest more. You, in total, you harvest more. And that what you harvest, you harvest it more efficiently. So this is uh, weird how you can break it down. Easy, in easy words, yeah. <laughs> so they are comparable, let's say, or they will be at some point comparable performance-wise to silicon solar cells. They are cheaper. They consume less energy while they are prepared. They are lighter. They are very thin. I think thinness, uh, there also comes a flexibility. So probably you could, yeah, code maybe rounded curves around the window or around or around uh, car roof exactly exactly yeah so you're raising a very important point here uh, i said this this low temperature or solution processing 
Uh, that means we can coat our solar cell onto a plastic foil. Plastic, plastics usually degrade starting at 200 degrees. Maybe some plastics can least um, uh, can last up to 250 degrees. Maybe uh, going close to 300, but then it's all over. Um, and so, as as long as you don't need such high processing temperatures, you can build your entire solar cell on top of these foils. And these foils, they come with uh, inherent flexibility. And these thin layers, they are they have no problems with with very low bending or very 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 small bending radii. So you can it's it's not bendable, but it's really flexible. And and this is this is um, yeah this is a very new thing that's, that that is we basically don't have with with silicon photovoltaics and this this opens up niches of new fields of application as you said you can you can um, think of a um, I don't know the English word tapete solar cell um, cover uh, for facades where you just put it on top and glue it everywhere because it's it's cheap and it's it's colorful and you just connect some wires and can harvest a lot of energy <laughs> yeah for free basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you said uh, this opens up niches but i would say it's the other way around i mean basically it's much more versatile uh, than commercial silicon solar cells because you can in principle yeah solution processes so solution process is something i would say like printing or spraying yeah. Or, um, yeah, you could print it like you print a newspaper, like with these big rolls, this roll to roll process, probably. Exactly. Yeah. And then you, then you have like a big roll of solar cells, which you could install. Basically, is it, are they transparent when they are so thin? This is something you can, you can, you can tune. So by choosing the, um, absorbers, they always have yeah, special colors. And um, so if you have, for example, a um, very low band gap absorber, then you let through all uh, light, I mean, the blue light, the green light, maybe also the yellow light and just absorb the red light or um, you go into infrared and then you absorb no visible light for our eyes. So they appear transparent while still generating some energy. Of course, they absorb less energy because they had through all the light so um, they don't generate as much energy as black solar cells not transparent ones would do but you can customize it and especially with all these organic semiconductors um, you can yeah achieve really colorful um, solar cell panels so you can make them uh, blue you can make them like greenish you can also have them yellow or red. So there are also some blue or purple solar cells. Yeah, I mean, wow. Could make art of, out of it, art installations, which are producing energy from, from Exactly, the sun. exactly. So it also looks cool. And this is maybe also something where um, these new solar cells could definitely help to um, yeah, sensibilize population in terms of, it doesn't need to be these big, rigid, ugly, um, big panels that are post installed on roofs, but they can be integrated. They can be part of the architecture if you're talking about buildings. Um, yeah. Before I have been talking more about niches in terms of um, competition with silicon solar cells in terms of um, their effective price over also their lifetime, um, because the lifetime is is basically basically the the bottleneck currently, um, they they don't survive as long as silicon solar cells do. That that would have been my question. Uh, I mean, we we before we come to the bottlenecks and the disadvantages. I mean, we talk there there are so many advantages of of these types of solar cells over commercial solar cells. Why aren't they like state of the art? Why are I mean they are state of the art, but why are they not applied everywhere? Yeah, this is this is a good question. I mean. So if you look a little bit of history into the history of, of silicon solar cells, um, we are now 2023. So we have them, um, yeah, let's say um, not available in a commercial market, but in research, they have been used for more than 60 years. So um, also 
of course, within the 60 years, there could be a lot of scientific progress and um, yeah, a lot of long-term studies of their stability that helped improving it over generation to generation. And yeah, this is uh, usually an iterative process. And since this field of perovskite, I mean, it doesn't exist at all 50 years ago. So no, no, nobody was, was aware that it's possible to use this certain crystal structure of perovskites with certain materials that you use in this crystal structure to, uh, uh, to use it in a solar cell that was um, not, not existent at that point. So all these material inventions within these last 15 years, um, there was no time to really do long-term tests with these because I mean, if you want to have a lifetime of 20 years for a solar cell, how can you find out if it's stable for 20 years, if it's, if there is no 20 year old solar cell? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can do all these accelerated aging tests, of course, that you do in the lab, maybe at elevated temperatures or yeah, difficult conditions, but they usually, I mean, they work out if you have data to compare it to real long-term experiments, because if not, you don't know if this accelerated aging, if you're doing it properly, if you can really simulate all the effects that are going to happen. And yeah, since material uh, innovations are so fast, you need to start all over again with a new material to test the stability again. And so this is why these stability tests, they, they lag behind the material inventions and high efficiency development. So I think right now we might end in the finish line or in, yeah, at least on the finish straight line of efficiencies. And this gives more freedom to understand the processes that we need to control to uh, prevent degradation and increase long-term stability. That's a good point. I mean, I remember when I heard the first time about these types of solar cells, I read some article in, in some spect Spectrum der Physik or some some G German German DFG uh, newspapers or so, and they stated that these are the two the two major challenges uh, of these new types of solar cells uh, is efficiency, but it's it's more or less okay I would say, and the second one is the is the limited lifetime. This is the bottleneck. Makes makes sense. We will see these types of solar cells sooner or later in real life applications and not only in the lab yeah so about, about this i'm very sure i mean you mentioned now two points uh, i would like to add the third point that is processing and upscaling so maybe maybe there it's um it's it's important to um to know that uh, the solution processable research solar cells they are usually spin coded and spin coding is a method that is really awesome for for uh, yeah <laughs> making your laboratories test cells because it's just fast and you can vary parameters easily and tune material properties and uh, yeah do a lot of series and studies there so, so spin, the, ju just a short interruption so spin coding is you drop something on a spinning wafer or a spinning foil and then or you give something on a wafer and then start to spin it and this way, the solution is yeah, covering in a very homogeneous way, in a very thin layer, the whole wafer for, or the whole substrate, so to say. That would be specific. Exactly. But the, exactly. the, the, the coated area is limited on a few square centimeters, I would say, typically. Exactly. Yeah. So because, I mean, it's relying on, on uh, centrifugal forces, you have some gradients uh, in a radial direction. So the, the homogeneity suffers if you're, if you're going towards larger areas. And so this is no process we can use for large scale production. And so apart from researching yeah, efficiency, as you said before, and also stability, it's how to upscale the production processes and to, yeah, I mean, this upscaling comes also with some, um, yeah, let's say challenges because, for example, maybe that's a, a explanation for, for perovskites, um, a big, big jump in their efficiency was achieved by doing a certain spin coating protocol that required the drop of an anti-solvent 
that forces crystallization. Yeah, I, I mean, with this anti-solvent, you change the structure. Uh, and I can imagine it has to be on a very specific time when you have to add it uh, and with a certain concentration and with a certain temperature. And if you are not following exactly this protocol uh, at exactly the same conditions every time, then you get a different crystal structure or a different perovskite structure and then you get a different performance. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to control the, um, to, to get reproducibility for the um, uh, polycrystalline structure, exactly. So uh, maybe this is something we need to know about these perovskites. They are not like monocrystalline um, crystals, but they are polycrystalline. And um, so there you, you, you want to have, um, there you need a specific way of crystal grow kinetics to achieve a good polycrystalline layer of a high quality in the end. And this is, this is a tricky thing with perovskites uh, done with, with this anti-solvent method usually. And so now what we need to do is to transfer it to other methods, for example, like printing, where you don't want to use an additional anti-solvent, or I mean, how do you want to deposit it? So it's, it's, uh, if it's a linear process and not a rotating process. So, um, this requires that you change, um, yeah, basically your processes first within lab scale and establish new processes that also you can compare with the conventional process and then from from that point you can think about upscaling these new processes then so if you scale it up like with spraying or printing or these other large scale deposition techniques you need to establish a new routine a new protocol in order to get a reproducible result from your lab experiments basically and this is also a major challenge of course yeah, yeah. So we, we, we need to, to mimic these processes that are known to to give solar cells of these very high efficiencies from spin coating and transfer this to to other processes that are um yeah not only giving you the possibility to achieve similar quality, but also to do it in a reproducible way that is very important for for industries yeah. so we talked a lot about solar cells um, but i mean i mentioned space and space applications in the introduction and what is what, what are you doing in space with these solar cells uh, let's talk about about the second part so you're bringing these types of solar cells into space and then you are investigating you're you're observing how they are performing up there yeah, so um, the, ex the, the experiment was um, we, we um, have these perovskite and organic solar cells and we mount them into our experiment that is part of the payload of a scientific uh, suborbital rocket. And in this, in this payload, what we did was all the time measuring these solar cells, which means we, you, you characterize their um, current voltage characteristics. So you basically collect a diode curve. And we did this during the rocket flight. That means including the start, including, including the phase, the rocket was up in space and orbital altitudes and exposed to the sun in different orientations because this was nothing we could control. And um, yeah, then this, this, uh, these solar cells have been out there for uh, several minutes. Um, and yeah, we measured, we measured the solar cells, um, to basically figure out if they are, if they are working up there at, at all, if you can make it technically possible. Um, so it's kind of a technology demonstration. And so if it's technically possible, how well are they functioning? What are our expectations and uh, what do we find out by doing that and of course this is this is a milestone for the application of these technologies also for space and this is so great that uh i mean you are you're you're 
you're in the lab all the time and you're doing all this research and then you are just packing all stuff together and pack it on a on a rocket and shoot it into space this is so great and right here i have to to say a short disclaimer because i recorded another episode with melanie Closel, a scientist at the dlr german aerospace center and there she also did a i mean it's not about solar cells it's about 3d printing in space but she used the very same rocket you also use for your solar cells to shoot her 3d printer into space and with her i talked a lot about this rocket and how it's working and uh, all these details so if you want to know more about this rocket and how this is working and about 3d printing in space and what uh, Melanie is up to, then I warmly recommend uh, this episode, which you find on my Spotify channel. Okay, so back to you, Leonard. Why is the performance of solar cells different in space and on Earth? In space, of course, you have different environmental conditions. You have a different solar spectrum up there. There is no atmosphere that is blocking UV radiation. Um, of course, without atmosphere, there comes vacuum, there uh, come more effects. If you're really going to orbit, you have these uh, strong temperature differences between day and night. And um, yeah, with time, you also have, might become problems with cosmic irradiation of uh, particles or the solar wind, things like that. Um, yeah, apart from that, so I think I want to, I want to emphasize two points there. Um, the first point is these solar cells are very interesting. I was talking about niches before. They are very interesting for space applications because they can be made such a lightweight manner. So if we think about these plastic foils um, that can be ultra thin as well, um, we, can, we can stack like 20 solar cells within the diameter of a human hair. I said something like that before, but um, this is just so incredibly thin that you can get huge areas with a very, very low weight. So in principle, when it comes down to weight, this is all about in space applications, because if you can save weight, um, yeah, this is basically defining the costs of your rocket launch. And so if you can make your solar cells lightweight, um, that helps saving money. And, and saving, saving fuel, probably. Saving fuel, putting more scientific instruments on top, um, sure, you can also come up with new, um, with, with, with new uh, engines, for example, um, these iron-based um, engines where you accelerate uh, ions, they need a lot of electric power, so you can uh, increase the available electric power on spacecrafts. You can, you can think about completely new ways of, of unfolding, you don't need any um, actuators anymore, you just can <laughs> think of solar cell balloons and inflate them if you want. So you are you have a total totally new field of, of possible applications. And I mean, on the way to orbit, we need a certain um, yeah like step in between. So there have been some um, tests to near space on a, a balloon flight that went up to stratosphere for several hours. Um, we did this experiment going to space for a short time, coming back to Earth, which makes it also possible to characterize them after the, the flight um, to see if we can see any changes in terms of the structure or the materials change, they degraded or they didn't, and uh, to find out things like that. Um, so I would consider this rocket flight as an intermediate step that gives the evidence that these solar cells indeed do work in these conditions and they work quite efficiently up there and so this is also kind of motivation to take the next step and to go to to uh, to a satellite which is then a long term or a long run experiment to to characterize them in long term stability experiment for example yeah exactly so to to have them up there for not only minutes and not only hours, but maybe uh, days, month, weeks, uh, sorry, weeks, month, exactly like that. And um, yeah, definitely we would need a stability of maybe few years, 
um, maybe one year is enough. I mean, these cube sets are not designed for lasting 20 years or so on, but um, so this is this is a field where they, they could be tested and also um, used first. And yeah, I was talking about niches before. Um, I think these technologies, due to the current lack of stability compared to conventional solar cells, they will um, fit in these niches first before being capable of competing with, with the big players. Probably it's a mean question, but of course I have to ask it. I mean, we have so many challenges we face down on Earth here. I mean, why are we focusing at all on on space technology, on solar cells in space, when we actually would them need in a much higher demand here on Earth? Definitely. So I also think certainly the terrestrial market or terrestrial application is definitely the main goal. Um, but still, space technology is, um, is something that can create huge momentum. So many inventions uh, we're using on Earth today, they might be based on a clever or creative idea that came up in rocket science. And um, so space exploration or, I mean, yeah, space research uh, helps establishing new technologies faster. So uh, if we can make things work up there, then uh, usually they will work as well down here. Um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is also one big point, like technology transfer. This is also um, maybe to motivate this entire Marfoy series of uh, the German Aerospace so Center. Marf Marfoy means all these sounding rockets, just as an side information. Yeah, it's uh, material physics without, gravi without gravity. And um, there are a lot of different scientific experiments that are, that are participating at the same time in one single rocket. And um, yeah, these experiments, they are very valuable experiments that uh, investigate exactly this kind of, of new materials, smart materials, how uh, fundamental physics change up there, but also how these can be transferred to, to, to Earth, to our everyday life. So conquering these niches, uh, if you would call space applications a niche, and to boost like the research, the fundamental research on these materials in order to apply them on a large scale on Earth, put it like that maybe. Yeah, yeah. This is this is this is how you could uh, create this this bridge <laughs> to back back to come back to Earth. Yeah, which is which is I need to say which is um, always has been very important for me because um, yeah, space space has this image of um, yeah being something privileged. Let's say so we have uh, yeah many more problems and. Um, yeah, actually, this is one of the reasons why I'm not doing astrophysics anymore. So um, I I've, I've figured that um, doing doing astrophysics it's for increasing the knowledge um, of tomorrow. While basically we need to do more urgent research here to 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 save the climate or our planet or ourselves today because i mean how can we benefit benefit from any wisdom um about yeah i did something about black holes um if earth simply becomes uninhabitable I mean, you switch from astrophysics to functional materials and you investigated solar cells and suddenly <laughs> you are shooting them up into space and it's kind of uh has an astrophysical touch again which is also makes a great great loop <laughs> on your story here <laughs> yeah i mean this is this is a very very delicate feel with feel because um <laughs> this this space uh, earth orbit has <laughs> nothing to do with real astrophysics <laughs> in, the, in the in the very very um in its very definition, maybe maybe s small scale astrophysics. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I get your point, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it, it was definitely very helpful to 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 be from this astrophysics background, um, 
so not not only because with with a yeah very broad background uh, it's easier to to think out of the box to come up with maybe unconventional or creative solutions to new problems and i mean of course all the program programming knowledge i i, I gained from that was uh, key for making possible all this data evaluation that followed this rocket flight of course okay maybe maybe a last question which uh, it's it's not mean but your science sounds awesome i mean it's solar cells it's uh, green energy it's clean energy it's space but still it's fundamental research uh, and i know that i struggled a lot with this question fundamental research takes very long to be applied in real life applications and it takes very long to really for, for these technologies for really make it for really making a difference on on earth how do you deal with that to investigate something that might have an impact in 10 15 20 plus years let's say i think maybe it, my, my background facilitated this a little bit because um when i started in this field of um of, of astrophysics before um it was never intended to be something within techn technological reach for us so it was just doing this research for increasing our knowledge without knowing if this knowledge um will eventually let's yeah pay off is maybe a fitting word in this regard because it's somehow converted into technology and and usable um but when i started so for example when i started in the field of perovskites uh, photovoltaics it was not um not clear this field would develop so quickly and come so close to a real application um, at, at that time, it was impossible to think of a, a rooftop um, perovskite solar farm that I recently read a publication about that they, they, uh, they have a test farm that is a few square meters large. Uh, it's a perovskite panel on a rooftop and it's, it's standing there for more than one year and it's still, it's, it's still producing reasonable power. I mean, it's basically, you can use it for really produce your electricity and it's also coming up with the upscale pr processing method. So this is already quite far in the process. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's turning, it's transitioning slowly from this fundamental thing to more application thing. But since I was doing fundamental things all the time, this is actually improvement for me personally. And um, yeah, maybe it comes back down to why, um, why to be a scientist or how to be a nerd. Um, if you investigate some very fundamental processes, mechanisms in new materials that you don't know yet, um, it's, it's always triggering curiosity. And um, yeah, just by having the feeling to contribute in this field of photovoltaics somehow is already uh, yeah, um, a very, very big improvement that, that motivates me, definitely. Just as a general, um, general saying about, about research, um, the most important thing is, um, yeah, keep your curiosity, stay a child inside and so science is always challenging because it's something, something new, something unknown. Turns always th things turn always out differently than you think in the beginning. Um, as, so literally always, and um, yeah. But but this this imagination of, as we said before, having these colorful solar cell panels all around us that are integrated in our everyday lives and um yeah it's, it's just a very cool thing thing to to dream about and um this is what what science is basically yeah in a nutshell <laughs> i couldn't have said it any better yeah i think that were perfect last words it's an amazing world i i love it i mean i love going to the lab i love going to conferences meeting new new people uh, analyzing results uh, whatever all these 
I mean, there is no real routine for, for a scientist. At least I haven't figured out any routine in the last six, seven years. But this is exactly what I love uh, about being a scientist. Um, always doing new things, meeting new people, um, doing podcasts. I mean, uh, it's great. Awesome. Thank you, Leonard, for being my guest in this podcast. Yeah, Lucas, thank you very much for having me as a guest. <laughs> Take care and see you soon. Bye bye. Bye. All right. That's it for today. If you have any questions to Leonard or me, just let us know in the Spotify comment section below. Or you can always reach out to me either on LinkedIn or Twitter. If you liked this episode, you might also like the previous one where I talked with Melanie Clusel from the German Aerospace Center about 3D printing in space. And don't forget, the best thing about this podcast really is that it's about you and everyone can participate. So if you want to share an exciting story about your science, your academic life, some crazy experiments or any other nerdy stuff, feel free to drop me a short message. Thanks for tuning in, take care and see you soon on the next episode of Your Friendly Physicist and Other Nerds. <laughs>